The Amber Room. In August 1944, the city of Königsberg, then part of Germany and now known as Kaliningrad, Russia, was devastated by Allied bombers. Among the casualties of this widespread bombing in the waning days of the Second World War was a medieval castle harboring a treasure far beyond the value of art or gold, shipping documents which contained the final destination of the legendary Amber Room. Constructed in 1701 in Berlin, the Amber Room was an architectural masterpiece, entirely framed in amber and gold. It was gifted to Peter the Great of Russia to solidify a Russo-Prussian alliance against Sweden. For over two centuries, it was the pride of the Tsars, housed within the Catherine Palace in St. Petersburg, then Leningrad, containing 13,000 pounds of amber across its 590 square feet. Its breathtaking beauty earned it the title Eighth Wonder of the World. However, its wealth and splendor eventually led to its downfall. As the Nazi army swept across Europe in the early 1940s, German soldiers were ordered to pillage and steal any artwork or wealth they could get their hands on. When the Wehrmacht reached Leningrad in 1941, they discovered the Amber Room, despite hasty Soviet efforts to conceal it. Peeling back the wallpaper used to disguise it, German engineers took the entire room down in 36 hours. Packed in 27 wooden crates, the Amber Room was shipped to Königsberg, where it was reassembled in the Königsberg Castle Museum. The museum director, Alfred Rhoda, spent over two years analyzing the Amber Room. In late 1943, he was ordered to dismantle the room and ship it deeper into Germany. The trail ends there. The Amber Room left Königsberg, never to be seen again. Today, scholars are divided on the possible locations of the Amber Room. Some believe it was never removed from Königsberg Castle and was destroyed with the rest of the city. Others believe it survived the bombing and is now hidden by the Russian government in modern-day Kaliningrad. Some attribute the disappearance to the Amber Room curse. Several high-profile people involved in the search for the legendary room have met untimely ends, including Rhoda himself. Others believe that the real Amber Room is still in Russia and that the one that was stolen was a fake built by Joseph Stalin. Yet, the most captivating theory emerged in 2020 with the discovery of the steamship Karlsruhe at the bottom of the Baltic Sea. The ship, the last to leave Königsberg before the bombing, is a prime candidate for carrying the Amber Room. Despite the discovery, the challenging conditions of the wreck have thwarted any search efforts. In 1993, a piece of the room surfaced in Germany, but the seller could not provide leads to the rest of the room, leaving investigators at a dead end. Until new discoveries are made, the fate of the Amber Room will continue to be a mystery, and the eighth wonder of the world may never be seen again. The Chapel of the Tablet In 587 BC, the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar II laid waste to Jerusalem, the proud capital of the kingdom of Judah, in response to its rebellion against Babylonian rule. The city's fall led to the plundering of its treasures and the destruction of significant landmarks, including the Temple of Solomon. Among the treasures, the Ark of the Covenant, a sacred chest holding the tablets of the Ten Commandments and a symbol of God's covenant with the Israelites, mysteriously vanished, escaping the clutches of Nebuchadnezzar. Legend suggests that this ancient vessel of God's will is hidden in plain sight, safeguarded in a land far from Jerusalem's walls. In the Ethiopian town of Aksum lies the Church of Our Lady Mary of Zion, initially built in the 4th century. The church was destroyed twice before the current building was constructed in the 16th and 17th centuries. According to the local clergy, the Ark of the Covenant was not in Jerusalem when it fell. It was, in fact, safe in the Church of Our Lady Mary of Zion. According to the monks that guard the Ark today, the Holy Relic's journey to Ethiopia was orchestrated by Menelik I, the legendary first king of Ethiopia and purported son of King Solomon. The narrative holds that Menelik brought the Ark to Aksum, once a city of great historical significance, where it was initially placed in the Church of Our Lady Mary of Zion. However, due to the divine heat emanating from the Ark, which allegedly began to crack the church's foundation, it was relocated to the adjacent chapel of the tablet. The veracity of the Ark of the Covenant has been impossible to verify for one simple reason. The monks that guard the chapel of the tablet would rather give up their lives 
and let anyone contaminate the Ark with their presence. These guardians, appointed for life, are said to choose their successors, dedicating their existence to the Ark's protection. Locals claim that they are trained to kill trespassers with their bare hands. The only known independent account of the chapel's interior comes from Edward Ullendorf, a member of the British Army during its 1941 campaign against Italian-occupied Ethiopia. Ullendorf claimed that upon entering the Chapel of the Tablet, they discovered not the Ark of the Covenant, but a tabo, a replica common in Ethiopian Orthodox churches. This account, however, stands as a singular perspective, with no subsequent scholarly verification possible due to the stringent restrictions on access to the chapel. Benjamin Franklin's Secret Room Secret shadow the legacies of the most influential figures of history, growing more complex with their power and fame. Even the Founding Fathers of the United States, celebrated for their pioneering vision, were not exempt from harboring concealed truths. In fact, a startling discovery in Benjamin Franklin's London residence redefined the adage skeletons in the closet with a literal twist. In 1998, Restoration work at 36 Craven Street, London, Benjamin Franklin's home for two decades preceding the American Revolution, unearthed the dreadful secret. The discovery of 1,200 human bone fragments, the remnants of 15 individuals, including six children, in a windowless room located under the home's garden, startled scholars and ignited wild speculation. These remains, many marked with surgical cuts and incisions, hinted at activities far removed from the genteel pursuits typically associated with Franklin. The secretive nature of the room's location fueled rampant speculation. Could Benjamin Franklin, a venerated founding father, have been a serial killer? Further analysis revealed that the bodies the bones belonged to were indeed brought to the room for an illegal purpose, but not one as evil as murder. Franklin did not own the house he lived in. He rented it from Margaret Stevenson. Stevenson's daughter, Polly, was a close friend of Franklin, and when she married the anatomist William Hewson, the house became an unlikely center for anatomical study. Dissection was illegal in England and restricted by stringent laws and societal taboos. Ever the innovator, Franklin proposed using the secluded room beneath the garden as a private laboratory for Hewson. Here, in defiance of the legal and ethical boundaries of the era, Hewson dissected cadavers to explore human anatomy. These bodies, likely acquired through bribery, theft, and smuggling, provided essential, albeit illicit, insights into the medical science of the time. Whether the renowned founding father helped his friend in these illicit and morbid activities is anyone's guess, and the truth of the level of his involvement in acquiring dead bodies for his friend likely died with Benjamin Franklin himself. North Korea Room 39 A rogue nation that operates internationally using threats and grandstanding, North Korea has spent the last 70 years completely closed to Western diplomats, with direct communication occurring sporadically and infrequently. Because of this isolationism, the details of the internal workings of Kim Jong-un's government are largely a mystery. However, one aspect of the North Korean government has been discovered by outside agents, a massive network of illegal financial procedures and black market activities. The organization that oversees these transactions is known as Room 39. Established in 1979 by Kim Jong-il, Room 39's mandate is to generate revenue for the luxurious lifestyles of the North Korean elite and finance the country's weapons development programs. This has led to a wide range of illicit activities, including drug smuggling and forced labor. The organization takes its name from Office Number 39 inside the Ruling Workers' Party building in Pyongyang, where it began operations. Though its methods are well known among other governments, the most mysterious part of Room 39 is its ability to change strategies at a moment's notice. In the late 20th century, the main revenue stream of Room 39 came from North Korean embassies that engaged in illicit financial activity and then sent the earnings back to Pyongyang. When foreign governments discovered these tactics, Room 39 shifted its strategy to drug smuggling. The size of Room 39's operations were and are staggering. In 2003, Australian police raided the North Korean ship Pong Su and found $160 million of heroin had been offloaded onto the beach. In recent years, with the drug trade becoming increasingly difficult, Room 39 has reportedly focused on direct cash smuggling and exploiting North Korean laborers abroad. Countries like Russia and China host North Korean workers, 
whose salaries are funneled back to Room 39. Ri Zheng Ho, a former high-ranking official within Room 39 who defected, shed light on these operations, revealing personal involvement in smuggling $10 million to North Korea in 2014 alone via Chinese ship captains. Despite Kim Jong-un's nominal leadership over Room 39, the organization's operations suggest a complex leadership structure that remains mysterious. Defectors have alluded to thousands of operatives working under Room 39, yet specific leaders' identities remain elusive. As the world grapples with the specter of cyber warfare, Room 39 has evolved once again, with forays into digital crimes posing new threats, from hacking financial institutions to cryptocurrency theft. The Lost Library of Ivan the Terrible For centuries, the legends of lost libraries have captivated humanity's imagination. Some, like the Library of Alexandria, are truly gone. Others, however, may still be out there, and some scholars believe that a treasure trove of ancient knowledge lies beneath the Kremlin, hidden under the noses of modern historians. The Lost Library of the Moscow Tsars, also known as the Lost Library of Ivan the Terrible, traces its origins to Grand Duke Ivan III, known as Ivan the Great. Ruling Russia from 1462 to 1505, he laid the foundation for a remarkable collection. His marriage in 1472 to Sofia Palaiologina, niece of the last Byzantine emperor, brought an extraordinary dowry that allegedly included a vast array of precious texts, encompassing scrolls from the Library of Alexandria and books from the Library of Constantinople. This collection was further enriched by Ivan's son, Vasily III, who, in 1518, showcased its treasures to Maximus the Greek, a renowned scholar. According to Andrei Krupski, a politician and close friend of Vasily III's son, quote, Maximus was astounded and impressed, and assured the prince that even in Greece, he had never seen so many Greek books. The library's legacy continued under Ivan the Terrible, who ascended to the throne in 1533. According to legend, he expanded the collection and moved it underground to safeguard it from Moscow's frequent fires in the 1500s. While some scholars suggest that Ivan translated the text into Russian, others propose that his scholars hesitated, fearing that the increasingly insane and despotic Tsar would use the black magic within the books against his own people. Following Ivan the Terrible's death, the library's whereabouts faded into obscurity, with only fleeting references surviving in historical records. The mystery deepened in 1929, when Russian archaeologist Ignatius Stiletsky believed he had pinpointed the library's location beneath the Kremlin's Arsenalnaya Towers. Despite initiating a dig in 1933, political turmoil and the outbreak of World War II halted progress, with Stiletsky's death in 1949 marking the permanent end of the quest. Today, scholars remain divided on whether the library ever existed, let alone whether it could be found today. The absence of any books definitively linked to the library fuels skepticism for some, while others argue it underscores the library's intact status, awaiting discovery. Daniel Clark Wall from the University of Seattle aptly summarized this debate in his 1987 article, The Unsolved Problem of Sar Ivan IV's Library, suggesting that the definitive resolution may only come from an exhaustive excavation of the Kremlin. Unless such a dramatic endeavor unfolds, we may never know the truth about the wealth of knowledge that Ivan the Great and his descendants guarded centuries ago. Which of these rooms do you think holds the darkest secrets? Let me know in the comments. As always, thank you for watching Dark Five. Like and subscribe to continue exploring the greatest mysteries of this world and beyond.